السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ a very good evening to all the doctors who have come online for today's webinar on pediatric pulmonology organized by Dubai Pediatric Club in affiliation with NMC Specialty Hospital and NMC uh, Jamban New Country Healthcare myself Taufik Ali country business manager of New Country Healthcare so before taking uh, without taking further ado i would like to invite dr sohrab tomarai president of dubai pediatric club to address the audience dr sohrab please thank you very much uh, mr tofir good evening ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the organizing uh, committee of dubai pediatric club and on behalf of the members of dubai pediatric club i would like to welcome all viewers from dubai uae gcc countries and other countries uh, tonight we have viewers and registration from united states india and uk so uh, this uh, webinar is uh, cme accredited in collaboration with the nmc special trust of dubai and this uh, webinar is sponsored by zambon uh, new country health i would like to thank the country business manager of this company Mr. Tofiq Ali, who always helps us, and for the last uh, seven years, he's sponsoring all our meetings. Well, uh, uh, tonight uh, we have eminent speaker. The topic is pediatric pulmonology. Two eminent pediatric pulmonologists, well known in the UAE, Dr. Fatima Jassim and Dr. Rizwana, well known. In a short while, I'll be introducing them. Uh, I would like to take your permission to share my slides. Is it okay, Mr. Tofiq? Mr. Tofiq? Yes, doctor. Ah. Yeah, once again, uh, good evening to all viewers. This picture you see is the LANEC examining a, a patient. Before a uh, mention of the stethoscope, the examination of heart and lung was in this way. They used to keep the ear on the chest and examine. And there, there was one interesting incident I'll share with you. Uh, after that, LANEC uh, invented the stethoscope. Well, As I said, to today we have eminent speakers, Dr. Fatma Jassim and Dr. Rizwana Papadia. And in the short while, I'll be introducing a moderator as well. Beautiful city of Dubai. I always say those who have not seen, especially we have viewers from other countries, those who have not seen, please come and see this beautiful city. Safe, clean, and the most beautiful. The members of Dubai Pediatric Club The members of the organizing committee, on behalf of all of them, I'd like to welcome all the viewers. Uh, we have Dr. Rajinder Joshi, the past president of the club, Dr. Kalpana Sengupta, secretary of the club, Dr. Diari Mohammad, chairman of the academic affair, Dr. Amir Mohammad Tolaymat, Dr. Ayman Jundi, Dr. Rafia Ouera, Dr. Srinivas Pandari, Dr. Leila Albahi, and Dr. Khaled Rashid. Well, as I said, uh, tonight we have two eminent uh, speakers. The topic is pediatric pulmonology and very interesting cases will be presented and discussed. Dr. Fatima Al-Jassim, senior consultant, pediatric pulmonologist at Latifa Hospital, Dubai, and Dr. Rizwana Papatia, consultant, pediatric pulmonologist at King College Hospital, Dubai. Of course, in UAE, everybody, Not them, but uh, since we have viewers from other countries who are uh, watching us for the first time, uh, in a short while I'll be introducing our speaker. We have uh, two moderators for this session, uh, Dr. Rajinder Joshi, past president of Dubai Pediatric Club, senior specialist pediatrician at Prime Hospital, and uh, he has a special interest in genetic and metabolic disorders, So we call him a genetic specialist also. And Dr. Kalpana Sengupta, 
Senior Specialist Pediatrician and Head of the Department of Pediatrics at NMC Specialty Hospital Dubai. She is Secretary of the Club. Well, on 26th of this month, we will have a webinar on pediatric surgery. We have eminent speaker, Dr. Ravi Ganojia, Professor of Pediatric Surgery from PGI Chandigarh, and Dr. Diari Muhammad, Senior Consultant, Pediatric Surgeon at Latifa Hospital. So on 26th, Monday, join us. Well, this is a question for audience. Who is this gentleman? Just identify and tell us why he's fa uh, famous. By the end of my talk, uh, Mr. Tofi will find the uh, correct answer and we'll announce the winners and we will give a uh, token of appreciation to the winner. Well, always I start the memory of uh, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, a brief history of, in just five minutes, I will give a brief history of pediatric pulmonology. Lanek, Lanek, I was telling about Lanek. Lanek, once he was in, uh, it was around 1816, 1816, he was walking in France in Loop. He saw two children. They are talking to each other through a wire connected to ice cream cup, 16 feet apart. He was, he was surprised how these people, I mean, children, they are talking to each other and hearing each other. But he just passed and walked away. What happened? Till that time, as I said, the examination chest was by putting the ear on the chest and examining. Once Lanek was called to see a lady from royal family who was very fat. And it was very embarrassing situation for him to examine this lady. Suddenly he remembered those children who were talking uh, to ice cream cup on the wire. Then he said, when they, they can talk 16 feet apart, why we can't hear the chest? Then he invented the stethoscope. This, this was a tube that he described all chest signs by this, especially the tuberculosis, uh, res, ronchi. These are actually the term which changed later on to V's and uh, res, ronchi, bronchophony, egophony, whispering, pectoralic. And he described all features of tuberculosis and unfortunately he died of tuberculosis at the young age. This is the stethoscope and evolution of the stethoscope. Well, just briefly about the origin of uh, pediatric pulmonology tonight. We are uh, talking about the, I mean, topic is pediatric pulmonology. As you see, it started in 1938 with cystic fibrosis. Uh, then the tuberculosis came, pulmonary infection, which led to infectious diseases and pediatric pulmonology, asthma, allergy. Then intensive care in 60s, which led to intensivists and newborn to the neonatologist. Well, this is briefly showing how pediatric pulmonology milestone developed. As you see, 1957, the chest section of American Academy of Pediatrics established. 1968, pediatric pulmonary centers were established and so on. I'm not going to the detail of that. And about cystic fibrosis, it is interesting to know in 1936, Pankoni, the famous pediatrician, described a case with the involvement of pancreas and bronchiectasis, but credit goes to Dr. Dorothy Anderson from United States in 1937 to 38 described, and also to a sweat colorite test for Dr. Dai San Agnes. And you see here on my right, is uh, Dr. Dorothy Anderson, who is famous for uh, describing cystic fibrosis. And my left is Dr. Uh, Paul B. San Agnes, who discovered the abnormality in the sweat electrolyte, the sweat test. They are famous for that. I'm not going to detail of that, just to remember these people. And this is in 1958, uh, Dr. Uh, Dorothy Anderson is receiving the uh, award for uh, describing cystic fibrosis. Well, now the winner um, till now, Dr. Doctor, um, uh, Mr. Tofik, now winner, we can decide because I'm going to announce. They are the famous people in pediatric pulmonology, one should know on the extreme left, Dr. John Mar Marroy, uh, this doctor, Dr. Edwin, 
Kendi, who is a very pioneer, in fact, he started and, uh, but the father of the pulmonology is Dr. Robert Melins, our question today. Dr. Thomas Keynes and Dr. Mary Allen Wolf, they are the pioneers in the field of pediatric pulmonology. And this Dr. Uh, Robert Melins, the founding father in the field of pediatric pulmonology. Dr. Melins, work led to the understanding of pulmonary edema, ventilation in infancy and childhood, lung mechanics, and community approach to asthma control. At least we should remember these fathers, if you are not remembering mothers. Well, the new generation of young uh, experienced uh, pediatric, pediatric pulmonologists who are, we are lucky to have as a speaker, Dr. Fatima Jassim, Briefly, she has requested us very briefly, very briefly, I will be introducing her. Dr. Fatima is a consultant pediatrician and pediatric pulmonologist and interventional bronchoscopist at Latifa Hospital, Dubai Health Authority, Dubai. She is Swedish and European board in general pediatrics from Saul Grinska University, Gothenburg, Sweden. Swedish and European Fellowship in Pediatric Pulmonology and Bronchoscopy from Karolinska Institute of Stockholm, Sweden. She has PhD in peripheral lung function in children with asthma and cystic fibrosis from Salgrinska University, Gothenburg, Sweden. She is president and chairperson of International Pediatric Pulmonary Society, vice president of Emirate Thoracic Society at Emirate Medical Association, member of very, various thoracic and respiratory societies among those European Cystic Fibrosis Society, European Respiratory Society, American Thoracic Society, CHESS, and Gothenburg Medical Society. She participated in many um, conferences, presentation, and, uh, and she's the award winner in France Award winner of the Young Investigator Award in the 8th Congress of International Pediatric Pulmonology in 2008. She has requested us not to read the whole. We just uh, combine ourselves uh, uh, here. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Rizwana Papadia. Dr. Rizwana is a medical director at Amana Healthcare Mubadala Health and the assistant professor of the pediatric at His Highness Muhammad bin Rashid University of Medicine and Health Sciences, Dubai. She's a consultant pediatric pulmonologist and a sleep medicine physician at Amana Healthcare and Keys College Hospital, Dubai. Prior to this, uh, uh, Dr. Rizmana worked as a pediatric pulmonologist and a sleep medicine physician at Al Jalila Children's Hospital, Dubai. Dr. Pavadia also worked as an assistant professor of pediatrics at Vail Cornell Medical College and assistant attending pediatrician at New York West Pythagorean Hospital, Vail Cornell Medical Center, United States. She is both certified in pediatric and pediatric pulmonology. In addition, Dr. Rizbana is the vice president of pediatric pulmonology chapter of Emirates Thoracic Society and Secretary of the Sleep Medicine Chapter of Emirates Thoracic Society. Well, with this, I end beautiful Dubai. Those who have not seen, they must come and see this beautiful city, you see. So I invite all those who have not seen come to this beautiful city. I end, now I would like to request Dr. Fatma, our speaker, to start her talk. Thank you very much. Welcome, Dr. Fatma. The stage is yours, floor is yours, mic is yours, everything. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Sahra, for the beautiful pediatric pulmonology slides and uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I thank you in person. I thank Dr. Kalpana, Dr. Jushi, and the whole organizing and uh, executive committee of the Dubai Pediatric Club. I'm very honored and very proud to be part of it uh, tonight. And inshallah, we are going to discuss uh, very nice, interesting cases in uh, pediatric uh, pulmonology. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sahab. I'm gonna share my screen now. If uh, Tawfiq uh, can help me and confirm. 
um, sharing the slides? Yes. Okay, yes. it's there, yeah? Okay. Um, uh, I would love to have your in, uh, interaction. Um, I don't see the full screen of, um, I don't see the chat, neither the, the people who would raise their hand, but I would be very uh, happy to have you interrupt me and share your thoughts, question, and even interaction. Uh, I'm going to ask some few questions just to keep you awake all the way. Uh, if you want to post your question to Tofiq, he'll, he can interrupt me as well and ask the question. So let's start with the first case. Um, it is Abdullah and he's 3.5 uh, months old. He came to us with a productive, productive cup. Uh, he had a recurrent episode of a recurrent cough and he received courses of oral antibiotic cough syrup as an outpatient clinic. With this a cough episode, he also had fever on and off. He had other complaints in addition to the persistent cough and fever on and off. He had greenish stool, which was frequent up to six times per day. When he came to us, he, were, he was dehydrated and he had a pneumonia. Please share your thoughts um, while we are going through the slides and uh, please let me hear your voice. I would be very happy. Um, um, penetrating the history, he was born um, at term, normal vaginal de delivery. There was nothing to report antenatally or postnatally. His birth weight was 3.2, and his neonatal screening at that time was not available. And he was born in other hospital, and he was admitted in other hospitals, so we had no access to any reports. He's the fourth child to first degree consanguineous parent, and he had a parental uh, uncle who died in early childhood, but we didn't know uh, why and when and how. He, his development was nor normal and appropriate to the age. His initial investigation, as you can see, showing low sodium, um, fine, um, uh, potassium by carb was on the higher level. So he was, let's say, dehydrated, yeah? His chest X-ray, which we do, didn't have access to in the beginning, he had a right upper loop consolidation. Um, they tried to correct him with fluid, so sodium was still low. Um, uh, by carb was corrected nicely, but he wasn't well. So he was started on IV antibiotic nobilization, trying to treat uh, pneumonia and to correct uh, the dehydration, thinking that dehydration was related to his pneumonia, so he was sick, and he was discharged in a stable condition. But then he got readmitted again and again and again. He got admitted at four months of age, at seven months of age, with the same story. And he was coming in with a new pneumonia, dehydrated again, markedly hyponatremia. He was again requiring IV antibiotic, IV fluid for the correction. Any thought that you can share with me so far? Uh, I can't hear you and I cannot see if you're chatting with me. Uh, Okay, let's go through his uh, chest X-ray, and it looks like this. You can see, um, you can see, um, infiltrate bilateral, and it looks like, for me, it looks like um, aspiration pneumonia, and it's more of uh, intertitial involvement. Okay, so there was no improvement over six months, and he was treated like normal pneumonia. There are two comments, doctor, saying it could be cystic fibrosis. MashaAllah. Okay, other than cystic fibrosis, why do you think it's cystic fibrosis? 
uh, let's continue. He's still having hyponatremia, still electrolyte unstable. Uh, bicarb always needs a correction. So he's always dehydrated. So in summary, this is a child who was seven months uh, of age at that time. He was uh, failing to thrive and he came with recurrent pneumonia, recurrent electrolyte abnormality and requiring correction every time. So what do you think? Okay, differential diagnosis. They thought it could be a renal problem, yeah, because of the electrolyte disturbance, but everything looked normal. Um, a stool test was uh, collected because he had frequent stool. They did further investigation with sweat chloride for those people who uh, thought it is cystic fibrosis. Immune status screen, immunoglobulin, it could be immune deficiency, which is giving him recurrent pneumonia. Even they thought about tuberculosis and they collected sputum catchal. It could be a bug that is resistant to the, the normal antibiotic that is given to him. Okay, surprise. Uh, sweat chloride came high and the cutoff uh, level is uh, up to 60. Uh, so he was above 100. Uh, is it definitely cystic fibrosis? Maybe yes, maybe no. You need to go further with other um, investigation. They also did a pancreatic illness case, which showed very low. So he has a pancreatic insufficiency. And they went further with the genetic test, and it showed high, high heterozygote variant uh, mutation, as mentioned, at the, and it is uh, Delta F508. So yes, this was uh, cystic fibrosis with a I wouldn't say a, typi a typical uh, presentation. Maybe pneumonia was um, um, typical, but then uh, dehydration, hyponatremia, uh, we call it pseudo barter presentation. It happens in, in uh, cystic fibrosis. So you have to think about cystic fibrosis when you have pseudo barter syndrome. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen in small children because they get dehydrated very rapidly. So this was the first case. And yes, he was in, immediately started on cystic fibrosis management in terms of enzyme replacement, uh, vitamin replacement, airway clearance, just physiotherapy, um, Dornase Alpha, which, is, uh, uh, which helped the uh, mucus to, uh, uh, to um, uh, evacuated easily, uh, correction of electrolyte, vitamin supplement, and, and the dietitian review for failing to thrive. Uh, he progressed very well, but he came, of course, with uh, multiple IV courses, uh, um, antibiotic IV uh, courses, including oral. Um, I'm going to go through the management and regimen of cystic fibrosis uh, later on in my slides. Um, he, he is up to date, alhamdulillah, not cor uh, chronic colonized with any bug. Unfortunately, due to severe inflammation he's having, he developed uh, bronchitis. Um, and I thought, and his culture was like mostly negative. Uh, so I thought maybe it's a bug that we are not catching with the sputum culture. So we did a ball for him through bronchoscopy and it came uh, negative. So it is more kind of an inflammation, severe inflammation uh, reaction. Um, this is his CT scan. Um, if you can see uh, the thick wall of the uh, bronchioles, um, uh, thick secretion over here. Uh, this is actually bronchitis here as well. And you see, see the thick wall here. So you can see a uh, thick wall, uh, thick airways here. These are bronchitis he's having. Um, yeah, and it's not that much extensive. So we try to slow down the progress. He's still very young, but uh, they, uh, 
there are many studies uh, showing that small children and infants can develop uh, bronchitis in uh, cases of cystic fibrosis early in life. Um, uh, the, he is three years old now. He's following in our cystic fibrosis clinic. He's uh, doing very well. He had no recurrent admission uh, since uh, the, the last one. And um, the uh, electrolyte imbalance result, and he's uh, following with us. He, uh, he has a very, very nice, committed, excellent parents. Um, that make me comfortable, so I don't need to uh, gurgle too much with them. So, mashallah, they are following, doing very well, and the child is growing, uh, weight um, development, everything is going on for, for him uh, very well, alhamdulillah, except with bronchitis. So, um, if you are ready, we'll move to case two. Um, and please uh, stop me if I go over the time. This is Zayed. He was five months old, Emirati. He came, he came to the hospital with history of cough, um, breathing, tif uh, breathing difficulty, which was uh, occasional. He also had greasy stool and uh, uh, recurrent regurgitation of uh, feet. He had pneumonia and failure to thrive. Quite similar case to the previous one, but let's see the difference here. He was a full term born with the normal de delivery, no reported issue antenatally or postnatally. His birth weight was 2.6 neonatal screening. I'll come to that. And he never had an hospital uh, admission. Parent here as well, they are first degree consagonists, and his development was appropriate. Okay. His neonatal screening showed that um, uh, I think it was borderline, I don't remember exactly, but um, they went further with the uh, Delta F508, and it was uh, uh, negative, yeah, because of uh, because of abnormal IRT, it was actually a border uh, line. So they went further with a genetic test, and they find no copies of Delta uh, five zero eight. He takes the chest X-ray. As you can see, he has a bilateral pneumonia. This is a retrocardial, and he has on the right side as well. He had a normal blood count. Um, he had mild hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and hypochloremia. His written culture was growing uh, strep pneumonia, and you can see the chest X-ray bilateral infiltrate. Um, as he had uh, regurgitation, so we did an ultrasound abdomen to rule out uh, uh, reflux. His echo was uh, normal. Any thought about the case? Please share it with me. Uh, so he was started on um, IV antibiotic as usual to treat the pneumonia mobilization. They did an electrolyte correction and they started him on high calorie formula uh, after the attrition review. So this is a bilateral pneumonia, respiratory distress, failure to drive, uh, diarrhea, uh, the management was uh, as mentioned. So, what do you think? Dr. Kalpana, if you hear, if you can see the malabsorption, yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Further investigation, normal LFT celiac screening was normal, thinking about his diarrhea, total IgE was normal, immune deficiency screening was normal, amylase lipase was normal, uh, ultrasound abdomen showed slightly fatty liver infiltration. Okay, any guidance on the diagnosis? Any guess? Sweat chloride, this time it was borderline. Yani if you have sweat chloride above 100, this is definitely 
cystic fibrosis. But then if you have border IRT and sweat chloride, it's not so definite. Yani. It is borderline 83. What would you do? You would insist on the cystic fibrosis diagnosis? A similar case to the previous one. Sweat chloride, sweat chloride was repeated and it was 93. Uh, 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 fecal elastase uh, uh, to indicate pancreatic insufficiency. It should uh, uh, below one uh, microgram per gram stool. Uh, normal is above 200. So his pancreas, he had a pancreas, uh, pancreas insufficiency. But he also had high calprotectin, which is uh, an indication on inflammatory bowel disease. We also checked his vitamin level. Uh, vitamin D was deficient, uh, so do I. Uh, but also vitamin A and vitamin E. So all vitamin levels were um, on the lower side. So what is this? Do you still insist on the cystic fibrosis? If you do, then you have to go further with the um, with a genetic test, Should which be. we did. Um, and we have analyzed the 31 most common CF uh, variant, and the result came negative. He doesn't have cystic fibrosis. Okay. But then we said, no, the symptoms goes with cystic fibrosis. He has a borderline um, uh, sweat chloride. He has uh, pancreatic insufficiency. He has abnormal stool. He has pneumonia. He has a pseudobarter. Everything goes with, with CF. Please give us the genetic mutation. Further, um, uh, yani, slightly more expanded panel uh, on detecting uh, uh, CF gene showed no pathologic variant. So what do you think? We left CF. What is the diagnosis? Any idea? Still possible. It's still possible to Dr. Kalpana. You are right. You have to insist on the diagnosis. Okay, so clinical presentation, abnormal sweat chloride, low pancreatic elastase, genetic test is not going on with us. Okay, we went further with another expanded panel. You can go up to, I think, 2,000 genes. And finally, yes, we found the mutation and he was a CF case. Um, and they present mostly with pancreatic insufficiency. Usually, um, children would have pancreatic insufficiency from four or five years of age and above. He presented very early with pancreatic insufficiency, and he has um, a severe form of pancreatic insufficiency, and uh, this is could be um, a severe form or a severe form of uh, uh, CF gene, uh, and we were lucky, I would say, so that this was a novel mutation, and it was not described. Um, uh, there was there were I think uh, four cases uh, in the world there that were uh, described and uh, found. Uh, so he had. Uh, and when they present with pancreatic insufficiency, they mainly have abdominal manifestation. I mean, their abdomen will be a problem all the time. They do have chest manifestation as well, but abdomen will be more dominant in these cases. So this was another cystic fibrosis with a, a slightly different presentation, but then um, a stubborn uh, genetic uh, uh, testing, uh, you have to, go, to be more stubborn than them and insist uh, and make sure, yani, have confidence in your diagnosis and the clinic assessment with the symptoms they are presenting. Let's go through the last case I have, uh, Hajra, six month, Pakistani here. Uh, she presented with a skin patch, was generalized all over the body. Uh, 
they treated her with pneumonia and she was seeking multiple clinics, but mafia by that. She also had generalized bruises and she came with fever this time. She was full term, normal delivery, nothing significant at birth. Birth weight was 2.5 and no previous admission. She's a third child again, but to second degree consanguineous uh, parent. And nothing um, specific or significant in family history. She was developing appropriately uh, up to the age. But when she came to us, she was failing to thrive. Her weight was, she was uh, seven months, but she was, uh, her weight was only 3.9. Um, uh, she was slightly tachycardic. She, her BP was on the lower side, uh, respiratory rate slightly on the higher side. She has no temperature. She was very thin and she was miserable uh, looking. She had multiple bruises with the skin flash. Her chest examination was normal. Uh, heart was normal. Abdomen was normal. CNS was normal apart from the skin and hair, uh, where she had the lashes and the general uh, She also had facial swelling um, and very, uh, very thin hair. Her investigation showed anemia, and it was severe anemia. Coagulation profile was disturbed. Liver function test was also disturbed with high enzyme, very high enzyme, and, and um, uh, electrolyte disturbance. So what is this? This is a different child, huh? different presentation. What do you think? Don't sleep, wake up. Any guess? Predominant liver involvement. Uh, pulmonary? No, the liver is affected more, I said. Liver is affected, everything is affected. Renal is affected, the skin is affected, everything is affected. So what do you think? Her chest X-ray showed only a bronchovascular marking, as you can see here. Abdominal ultrasound, nothing remarkable. They didn't even see the brain, yani, and it was normal. What do you think? Six month old, coagulopathy, uh, affected liver, a skin manifestation, hemolytic anemia, sepsis, low BP, tachycardia, respiratory distress. What is the sepsis? DIC? Any comment? Okay, they went further with the investigation. Uh, they did the blood film just to see the cause of the um, anemia, stool test, with chloride again, alpha-1 antitrypsin because of the liver infection, um, uh, immune screening, um, TB screening, and even a congenital infection. Uh, good food, as we can capture. What do you think? Dr. Sohrab, your uh, your audience is sleeping, Danny. Mafi good. Wallah, mafi good. We, we will give prize to the, the, the winner. Those who answer uh, your question correct, we will give them a uh, prize. At the end, we will announce their name also. <laughs> okay. Her stool was yani, frequent to very loose, but result came and negative. Um, weight was... A is static, although she was reviewed by the dietitian, she was on high calorie hormone diet, but she still was not gaining uh, weight. Um, her uh, coagulation profile improved with uh, vitamin K injection and um, uh, uh, yani the treatment available. Uh, hemoglobin, she got a blood transfusion and her blood cell showed microcytosis, uh, reactive lycocytosis, normal platelet, any, nothing uh, alarming or abnormal. Spiritum culture came positive for staph iris. 
and she was some of the thoughts uh, that are here doctor i will tell you about uh, the audience uh, they are talking about inborn error of metabolism or immunodeficiency very good thought okay so i need to go uh, and the chat downwards and so okay sickle said bad good good idea hlh very good yes, thought HLH. because of the skin manifestation yeah. Me metabolic disease yes but i'm not uh, i'm not a metabolic doctor well a genetic doctor i don't understand at all i i only understand pulmonary okay but hlh very good thought um uh, we fail to collect uh, sweat chloride due to her skin manifestation and very dry skin. Yani, there was no um, uh, no sweat to collect. And um, uh, immune deficiency workup came normal. She was uh, discharged in a relatively good uh, condition. With the formula, with the um, elemental formula, vitamin supplement, and they give her a follow up in the clinic. She came back, but no weight gain. She was still having frequent loose stool. Her liver function coagulation profile uh, improved and remained stable, alhamdulillah. Hemoglobin remained stable. Sweat chloride came. 119. So this is what definitely cystic fibrosis. And we always uh, take uh, two tests to confirm uh, because sometimes uh, you never know. So two tests to confirm uh, high sweat chloride uh, result. And her genetic test came uh, homozygote delta F50. Uh, so this is a third case uh, cystic fibrosis with totally different presentation. So keep in mind, uh, cystic fibrosis diagnosis when you have any yani, abnormal presentation. Actually, this case had a staph iris uh, uh, colonization. Uh, it is a hint uh, for uh, cystic fibrosis. Also, if you have a child with pseudo uh, Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa, uh, think about cystic fibrosis, especially early in age. So this uh, patient was also started on uh, cystic fibrosis uh, management. Um, she came back to us, she's still following with us. Uh, she had a multiple course of IV enteritic, oral enteritic, and lysis enteritic. Uh, unfortunately, she got chronic colonized with the staph aureus at the age of four years. And she is having intermittent pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa colonization. And she developed thrombosis as well. Um, uh, further follow up, she's currently, I think, nine years. Um, further follow up, she also developed ABPA, where uh, her aspergillosis screening came high. Uh, total IgE high as asper, uh, per aspergillus uh, antigen uh, came later positive, antibodies came positive, and even um, RAST for aspergillus came positive. Uh, and this is her uh, CT scan, as you can see. She already has uh, bronchitis. Yeah, you see the thick uh, airways here. I'm sorry. And uh, here in the right upper loop, uh, you can see further this, that the left uh, lower loop is uh, too much uh, involved. Uh, ac actually, her uh, uh, condition got worse, uh, especially after ABPA. Uh, but alhamdulillah, we, we detected it very early because we do regular investigation, annual investigation, and aspergillus uh, detection is part of our annual investigation. So she was started on antifungal. Um, omalizumab immunotherapy is part of uh, um, ABPA treatment. And we referred her to thoracic uh, surgeon to think about lobotomy because um, when you, once you have a bad loop, it can affect the other loop. Yani. And she's chronic colonized there. And uh, this 
uh, could progress to the other part of the lung, which we don't want to. Uh, actually, uh, her bronchitis is developed to cystic changes. So this, this loop, the left lower loop, was almost yani, fully damaged. Um, she also has pancreatic insufficiency uh, uh, proven by pancreatic LSTs or fatal LSTs. She also had uh, fatty liver, so she was started on also deoxycholinergic. Uh, malabsorption and nutrition improved, alhamdulillah. She also had the rectal prolapse, and usually they have it because of the uh, frequent constipation. And it was managed conservatively, and this rectal prolapse has improved markedly lately. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so you can see her weight, how it uh, jumped up to normal weight after uh, follow up. Alhamdulillah. Uh, she is on all these uh, medication when it comes to respiratory, uh, GI medication, all these. Uh, also, we always recommend high-fat diet, high-protein, not for you, but for cystic fibrosis uh, patient, uh, and with high-calorie uh, diet, um, because we know uh, high-fat, high-protein, high-calorie diet prolongs survival of uh, uh, cystic fibrosis patient. It gives them, it gives them even a better um, uh, yani a good fight against uh, and this uh, and chest infection mean. Um, so I thought I would just share some slide regarding cystic fibrosis. These are the cases I thought to share with you. But then I'm gonna say talk about cystic fibrosis in general. If I still have time, please, Dr. Kalpana, Dr. Sohrab, interrupt me if I go over the time. I need to leave. A space for Dr. Uh, Razwana. Uh, beware the salty child and they will surely die. This was a comment from a, uh, a German folklore um, regarding cystic fibrosis uh, patient. There, there is another thing that also uh, beware about the rinky child because of the, um, the salt they, they lose uh, as if they are in water or we do know that cystic fibrosis is uh, autosomal uh, recessive, and this is a point to square. 25% uh, um, chance of getting uh, uh, cystic fibrosis child if you have both parents. Uh, uh, a mutation, it's in the chromosome 7, and uh, chromosome 7 encode for the CFTR. Uh, which is uh, the regulator um, uh, protein. And uh, if, if the CFTR doesn't work, then the chloride channel will be, will be blocked. The chloride won't be on the surface of the, uh, of the cell, and the, therefore the mucus will be very thick, and the, uh, the damage would be there, and CF we know it damaged mostly the lung, but uh, yani, uh, we do have uh, other manifestation. It does affect the exocrine gland depression, like uh, pancreas, uh, intestine, um, uh, and they develop um, cystic fibrosis uh, manifestation. So simply the chloride the channel uh, doesn't work and you have more uh, reabsorption of water and sodium than normal, which will make the secretion on the surface of the cell uh, very thick and viscous, and it will obstruct the gland and duct, the, the duct, so enzyme will not uh, float easily, and gradually it will damage the uh, exocrine uh, tissues. Um, we know that it affects uh, many uh, organs, mainly the lung, but many organs are uh, affected. Uh, when it comes to the lung, we know that we, they have uh, too much mucus production uh, in the respiratory tract, and they have uh, any impairment in clearing the uh, secretion, which lead to uh, chronic lung disease. It, yeah, 
شيء زي ويل هاف ريكرنت انفكشن بعدين ارتبكتسز فردر برونك اكتسز بعدين دايليتيشن اوف ذا وول زي ويل هاف سيستيك تشينجز اند ذن بيرمننت دامج اوف ذا لانج ويتش ويل ليد ultimately to respiratory failure and then they will require uh, transplantation. When it comes to abdominal manifestation, uh, they, they have a pancreatic enzyme uh, deficiency and therefore the digestion will be uh, impaired because there is no enzyme secreted in the, uh, uh, in the duct and there will be impaired absorption of protein, carbohydrate and fat which will lead to um, um, fibrotic changes in the, in, uh, in the pancreas, leading to uh, diabetes, of course. Um, you would have a disturbance of the electrolyte because um, the chloride channel uh, is not working, and you, usually they have a very salty taste in their skin. Pulmonary manifestation, they will always have cough, of course. They will wheeze. You will see hyperinflation initially before you see pneumonia. They will have recurrent infection. They will present with respiratory distress or uh, only cough and pneumonia. Um, a pulmonary function test, it's not so consistent, uh, but it can lead you to an obstructive airway disease. Um, other manifestation than pulmonary, gastrointestinal, they will have pancreatic insufficiency, recurrent abdominal pain, constipation. Sometimes they do, they go into intussusception. Uh, they have liver involvement with fatty liver. They will end up with cirrhosis in adulthood. Uh, vitamin disturbance because of uh, poor absorption. Uh, they can have pancreatitis also, which is recurrent. They can end up with chronic pancreatitis and they will lose weight. Um, uh, they will have problem with infertility because of the uh, sick mucus and the duct as well. A newborn, they can present with meconium ileus. Those who present with meconium ileus, they also will have mainly abdominal manifestation, uh, but of course uh, pulmonary as well. They will have uh, uh, pancreatic insufficiency as well. Uh, due to um, uh, chronic hypoxemia, they will have uh, clubbing of the extremities. They will always uh, taste uh, salty. They will have uh, poor uh, development of the growth and weight. As diagnosis is, yes, a sweat chloride, but then sometimes you have intermittent reading. So you have to confirm it with the genetic testing. And you, you insist on the genetic testing. If you have the cyst symptoms, if you have the gut feeling, the cystic fibrosis, until you find the gene uh, mutation. Um, chest X-ray, yes, we always do just to see the progress and the um, uh, progressive of the disease in the lung. Uh, they can have uh, sinusitis, they can have adenoid as well, they can have polyp as well. Uh, it can give you a thought about uh, cystic fibrosis. Sputum culture, we always do to detect uh, the bug and treat it accordingly. I mean, every visit, lasm sputum culture. Um, uh, the paradigm of uh, CF actually started in the 50s. So uh, in 55, um, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was founded by uh, this gentleman. And then since then, the care of Cystic Fibrosis has started. And it was initiated uh, uh, initially in a small center. Uh, and then the one center became two center. And this led to uh, a, a, a survival of initially 10 years, but then it went to uh, 16 years, but then 18 years. Now, mashallah, we have a survival up to uh, 50 and even 70 years. And because of the 
um, uh, CF care and the good management uh, we are providing. We know that cystic fibrosis has no cure, but we can slow down the progress and we can prolong the survival of these cases. Uh, uh, so when the when the uh, cystic fibrosis care management uh, initiated, and it was mainly the um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, taking care of the airway obstruction and fiction and nutrition, these are the triad you take care of in CF and focus on the prevention rather than having uh, treatment. This gave uh, uh, a mortality rate of as low as 1% per year, and it was much higher previously, and 81% clinical improvement and stabilization. So you can see a survival, a median survival of cystic fibrosis from the 80s up to um, up to 17 years. Uh, mashallah, now you have cystic fibrosis cases who are 50 years. I have personally seen a 70 years old uh, with cystic fibrosis who had a lung transplant and he was cycling, he was living his life 70 years old, more healthy than I am, mashallah. Um, again, median survival. So uh, with, with the management of cystic fibrosis, yes, uh, they can have almost a normal life, but with all the medication and management they are having. Um, management, uh, we have good guidelines, we have very good references. Uh, if you go to the European Cystic Fibrosis uh, Soy Society and even American Cystic Fibrosis, you can find uh, a, book, uh, a very thick book about uh, uh, management and treatment of uh, cystic fibrosis. But to manage those, you need all uh, these professionals to be involved. Yani you need a multidisciplinary team. Alhamdulillah, I'm very blessed with a very, very good team in Latifa Hospital. I thank them personally for their effort. Um, but we do uh, lack uh, some of the um, key person uh, in the team. Um, uh, uh, you also need a multidisciplinary uh, specialty involved like endocrinologists, rheumatologists, nephrologists, um, uh, yani, uh, other specialty because they do develop many complications. So we have no cure, but prevention is number one, or by then treat immediately, yani take over the infection. Even if they have upper respiratory inf uh, infection, we do treat with antibiotic. Of course, we take uh, we collect the sputum culture and we treat uh, accordingly. We have to clear the lung continuously. You see, God created the lung uh, with a clearance 24 hours. We are asking them to clear the lung twice or three times per day, which is nothing in comparison, yani, but you have to keep the lung uh, clear. It takes a lot of involvement, engagement, commitment, but you have to be there for them all the time. Um, good nutrition, it is the key for um, uh, good prevention and treatment of uh, uh, cystic fibrosis. We spend a lot of time with the family. We get close to them. We know them very well. Uh, we know all family members. We try to uh, answer all questions. Mashallah, my team, they distribute their phone number, WhatsApp, they have direct communication with the uh, family, so they immediately contact us and we take uh, action uh, immediately. So the treatment is uh, uh, mainly clearing uh, the lung, anti-inflammatory, antibiotic. Sometimes you go to lung uh, transplant, but then I will end up with the gene therapy, which is uh, the latest antibiotic all the time, bronchodilator all the time, mucus clearing uh, strategy all the time, physiotherapy, they have to do it. Pulmonary rehabilitation with the help of RTs, respiratory therapists and physiotherapists, uh, they need to learn how to do it, but they are on frequent visit to the um, uh, physiotherapy as well. Oxygen when they need that lung transplant, what they need when they need them. Nutrition, as I mentioned, 
is the key for uh, better survival, um, slower progression of the disease. A dedicated team, as mentioned, and you need a multidisciplinary team where you can refer to them easily. They should understand uh, cystic fibrosis and the um, yani disease involvement of uh, cystic fibrosis. What we do in our clinic, we, we have regular follow-up, six to eight weeks, maximum two months. Yani if they are doing slightly well, we check the weight every time. We do lung function uh, almost every three months. We collect sputum culture on each visit extra if they have upper respiratory tract infection or, they have, or if they developed a cough. They have many devices. They know how to clear their uh, airway. They have regular contact with the dietitian. We uh, regulate their pancreatic enzyme, vitamins, calories regularly. This is a time consuming. Uh, consuming, they, they need your dedication because it's a difficult uh, disease. Annual review, we do all blood investigation once a year. Uh, extra, if we need that, we do regular chest X-ray, high resolution CT scan to just see the progression of the disease. Maybe sometimes you need to intensify the disease. Ultrasound abdomen, yes, regularly on uh, liver. Spirometry, if they are above five or six years of age. Um, uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test for those who are older. Uh, OGGT, yes, OGTT, yes, uh, regularly because they can develop their beta smell. This, and I have one of my youngest uh, children who developed, unfortunately, diabetes mellitus as, at age of four years, which was quite surprising. Yani, but alhamdulillah, we detected it very early. Blood test, yes, regular. You have to check everything, imagine everything. So they give a lot of blood when they do. And then uh, after you get the result, you adjust the therapy accordingly. Pancreas enzyme, you adjust it until you get a normal stool. They shouldn't have abdominal pain. And they should have a normal weight gain with a good amount of pancreatic enzyme. Uh, extra vitamin supplement, lazim. Mucus clearance all the time. Prophylactic antibiotic in uh, small children, yes, if they have like uh, chronic uh, colonization of the staph aureus. So we give them clopidogrel prophylaxis uh, for about two years. Oral antibiotic, minimum 14 days, even if they have uh, upper respiratory tract infection, we try to cover a staph and hemophilus influenza, which is very common in cystic fibrosis in early age. If you find any bacteria, you treat it appropriately according, according to the sensitivity, minimum 14 days. If you detect pseudomonas, eradicate it immediately. And you have to make sure they have no cough. If they have cough, and if there is a problem, you have to treat it accordingly. Physiotherapy from the beginning. Um, hypertonic saline, Dornis alpha, all these we start early because we want to slow their progression. Two minutes uh, more, doctor. Okay, I'll make it fast. So abdominal manifestation, yes, they can have uh, micro gallbladder, uh, bile stone, uh, uh, liver, um, fatty liver. Um, they can have cirrhosis, but mostly in other uh, varices they have. Uh, cirrhosis, and this is a picture on cirrhosis. I'm coming to the end. Who to treat, who not to treat. I treat everybody who has high liver enzyme and they have fat on the liver with also deoxycholic acid. This is the dose we do, usually use. And we do uh, ultrasound. We can stop treatment if they um, if they improve. Uh, meconium illness, yes, they can have abdominal manifestation. Or you can never tell who will have liver disease, who will not have liver disease. Um, uh, DOs, very important. Uh, if they have constipation or they have presented with meconium ileus, they can have problem with constipation. Um, and usually if they have a, a drained motility, dehydrated mucus, uh, high inflammation, they can develop uh, DOs. Uh, uh, but how we treat it with morphic call, sometimes we give enema, and it's usually treated by a surgeon. They are very good in that. 
Other manifestation, they can have uh, regurgitation, intussusception, yes. They can have overgrowth of bacteria in their small intestine. Uh, they sometimes need pig to have a good better nutrition, um, uh, they can develop diabetes mellitus or even osteoporosis. We need to increase awareness so they can get their right for treatment. Yani they are fighting for their breath, they don't need to fight for their breath. Uh, and early diagnosis is very important. So now, alhamdulillah, we have the gene therapy and, and, and very simple work. Uh, gene therapy to improve the channel or, sorry, to improve the synthesis of um, uh, the uh, uh, CFTR protein itself. So either you open the channel or you improve the development of the protein itself. Uh, it's available in uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, we don't have it in uh, DHA. We refer patients to Abu Dhabi for their gene treatment. It's very good. They improve their sweat chloride, uh, become normal. Their lung function test improve with 10 to 15%. Uh, they have almost no admission to the hospital. Recurrent infection improve. Um, uh, even their weight go goes much better. So thank you very much for listening. Thank I you hope uh, you will diagnose cystic fibrosis now easily out of their thoughts. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatra, for the excellent presentation of very interesting cases. I'm sure the viewers have enjoyed. There will be a lot of questions and discussions. And now I would like to request uh, our next speaker, Dr. Rezvana, who is joining us from United States of America and who is presenting two cases for us, very interesting cases. Now I would like to inform our viewers Dr. Rizwana will be asking two questions. Those who answer correct, they will go to the poll and they may get a good token of appreciation and the name will be announced. Dr. Rizwana, mic is yours, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarab. Um, give me a second to upload my presentation, please. Can you see my presentation or no? No, 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 not yet. Now? No. No, okay, let me let me stop sharing and yeah. Give me one second, okay? Let me. It's okay. Okay. I think now you would be able to see my presentation, right? Yes. Yes, you can make it in yes, I will make it a uh, slideshow for. Yeah. Can you see it now? Is it, can I, am I yes, audible yes. and visible both? Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for this opportunity to present a couple of interesting pulmonary cases. I have two cases, I will take 10 minutes each per case. And Dr. Kalpana, if you don't mind giving me a reminder at nine minutes and 19 minutes so that I know sure. I keep track of time. Um, the first case is going to be um, kind of a diagnostic dilemma case, like, you know, very interesting. Um, it took years to diagnose this case. And the second one is um, pulmonary manifestation of rheumatological disease. And like, you know, how it is an eye opener that um, other diseases other than pulmonary diseases have um, a lot of respiratory manifestations due to the disease process itself and uh, or due to the medications used for treating those conditions. Um, the goals of today's talk is it's gonna be an interactive discussion. We will review how common clinical presentation have uncommon diagnosis and we'll have learning uh, pearls from those cases. So this is uh, our first case. We have a 16 year old girl who presented to the pulmonary clinic with history of trouble breathing for the past three to four years. So I want the audience to pay attention that the case I'm going to describe to you in eight to 10 minutes have been going on, the presentation has been going on for the past four years. Now she describes her trouble breathing as difficulty in catching her breath, which has progressively worsened over time. 
and she was evaluated on multiple occasions by multiple physicians and uh, for her recurrent respiratory sim symptoms, her oxygen saturation was fine, her spirometry, EKG, and CT scan, which is kind of the normal baseline workup for recurrent episodes of trouble breathing were normal, right? Um, because she also had um, an additional diagnosis of anxiety and depression or a past history of those symptoms, what do we do usually, right? When we don't get any medical answers for the presentation of patients, we sometimes uh, diagnose them as having um, psychological or panic attacks and similar thing happened to her. She was diagnosed as having panic attacks based on her history. Now the time passes on. Now the symptoms are going on for three or four years. In between, she also develops dizziness, chest pain and palpitations over time. And she was evaluated by a cardiologist and her cardiac evaluation, which included a normal chest X-ray and a normal EKG. Then she was um, also seen by a neurologist because she had some gait instability. She complained of lightheadedness. She had headaches, she had memory lapses and she had academic decline. So because of all these neuropsychiatric symptoms, she was also seen by a neurologist and um, the brain MRI was normal, Lyme titers were normal, and vitamin B12 was normal. I also wanted to mention that the baseline workup, which included blood counts, electrolytes, EKG, echocardiogram, Holter monitoring, and chest X-ray were also unremarkable. So now we'll look at the physical examination in our clinic. Uh, oxygen saturation was 100% in room air, respiratory rate of 28, heart rate of 73. Uh, rest of the examination was fine, lungs were clear, no murmurs were heard, and extremities were fine, no clubbing, no sinuses. And she had no signs of respiratory distress or retractions. So I think there is a quiz question coming now, correct, Taufik? Yes, sir. Okay, so can we load the quiz, quiz question, please? So what do you think, based on the available information, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? I just want to feel the pulse of the audience, whether you think it's infectious, autoimmune, neurological dysfunction, interstitial lung disease, or autonomic dysfunction. And the poll time starts now. You have 30 seconds to answer the question, then we'll look at the results. Wonderful. So the poll is like, you know, spread everywhere as like, you know, we were also as confused as you guys are. And I think the maximum answer is 34% people have chosen autonomic dysfunction and like kind of similar people have chosen autoimmune. So let's go further into the case and see what's going to happen. I'm not, going, uh, not able to move the slides further. Do I have to do anything? Perfect. Yes, you can move it, Doctor. No, it's not moving. Should I stop sharing and reshare? Um, Let's try, try that. Yeah, I think it's yeah. better. Maybe. Okay, let me reshare the slides. Okay, so for the course, um, she had recurrent episodes of cough and trouble breathing uh, for the past six months, and she was treated with mentholine, inhaled steroids, and antibiotics multiple courses without any clinical improvement. And um, on one such occasion during the emergency room, during one of her respiratory exacerbations, she was found to have orthostatic hypertension. 
The repeat workup was unremarkable. So everything like CBC, electrolytes, chest X-ray, CT scans, everything was repeated and nothing came out of those investigations. So now like, you know, I left an important part of the physical examination, which we did in the pulmonary clinic. So all the normal vital status was in supine position. When we made her standing upright for four minutes, her vitals changed. Her oxygen saturation dropped between 88 to 94%, so she was mildly hypoxemic. Her respiratory rate went up from 22 to 28, and her heart rate increased by um, 76 beats per minute. Her heart rate was close to 150 beats per minute when she stood for four minutes. Again, the physical examination was, um, comprehensive physical exam was normal and she had orthostatic hypotension and she also started feeling dizzy. She started having tachypnea and all other orthostatic symptoms when she stood for four minutes. This is her initial chest X-ray. And uh, except for some bronchomuscular markings, I mean, if you push it to call a little bit of hyperinflation, there was nothing much on the X-ray. Now let's look at her pulmonary function test. So her pulmonary function test, if you look at this, um, graph, it looks normal. Like, you know, her inspiratory curve is not complete, but it looks good too. She was able to breathe for more than like you know, around five seconds. So it's an acceptable study. And these were the values. So in upright position, she had a normal lung function test. Her FVC, her FEV1, her ratio, everything is more than 80. She had no evidence of restrictive lung disease because her TLC is more than 80. She has no evidence of air trapping because her RV residual volume over total lung capacity ratio was normal. So her flow volumes, her lung capacity, her air trapping, everything was fine. But her diffusing capacity was severely reduced to 49, should be 80 and above. And when you make her supine, when she goes in supine position, her diffusing capacity became completely normal from 49, which is severely reduced to 110. And her oxygen saturation also improved to 97% and it sustained. Um, the further workup, as I said, the chest X-ray was done, which revealed some hyperinflated lungs. We also did plasma catecholamines. And that's done because um, some kids with uh, dysautonomia or POT syndrome, which is post uh, postural orthostatic uh, tachycardia syndrome, they also have reduced clearance of catecholamines. We did DHA, DHEAS and cortisol level to rule out adrenal insufficiency. We did plasma renin, plasma and urine osmolality and electrolytes for ruling out um, any neurohumoral deficiency of plasma volume. And thyroid function tests were done to rule out um, as, as one of the reasons for tachycardia as hyperthyroidism. And the provisional diagnosis of POT syndrome, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome was um, made based on, on the following findings. She was also referred to a cardiologist and a specialist to confirm the diagnosis. And one she minute, did, doctor, for your first case. Okay, um, I will need one more minute. She responded to hydration, optimal um, salt supplements and fludrocortisone. She was also given compressive stockings and supervised exercise. Repeat lung function test done six months later after this treatment showed diffusing capacity of 70, which is in mildly reduced range compared to 49, which she had. She could walk for three minutes with sustained saturations of 97%. And I have one slide on port. So dysautonomia, as the name suggests, is um, an autonomic instability, right? And our autonomic nervous system consists of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So they're very fine-tuned in homeostasis, right, in all of us. But when there is dysautonomia, there is an imbalance of one of the systems. And one dominates over the other, and then all the symptoms happen. This case is very unusual because they do not present with the presenting symptoms is usually not respiratory for pulse. It's usually either um, cardiac or like neurological, like fainting or something like that. So POTS is defined as if you have orthostatic symptoms associated with increase in heart rate of 30 beats per minute within first 10 minutes of standing up, and it is not associated with any chronic disease or any confounding medication intake. So that's basically POTS is orthostatic increase in heart rate. 
Now the patient presented with dyspnea, right? And possibly that would be related to increased sympathetic hyperactivity. And when you have sympathetic hyperactivity that clamps your blood vessels. So that could have reduced the pulmonary blood flow. And also when you have orthostatic hypotension, your blood pressure reduces in standing position. And that also reduces your blood supply to the lungs. And that reduced blood, pulmonary blood flow can reduce diffusing capacity. Uh, diffusing capacity in supine and standing position is a very non-invasive tool to identify the reason for pulmonary manifestation or complication of port syndrome. So that's about my first case. Uh, and orthostatic vitals in unusual dyspnea presentation can be very helpful too. So this is kind of like, you know, a very unusual presentation, a tricky case, took multiple years for somebody to diagnose. And then um, once it, she was treated, she did very well. Now, case two, and before we start case two, we will take a short poll again, Tofik, over to you. So what percentage of patients do you think with rheumatological condition have pulmonary involvement? 7%, 17, 27, 37, or 47%. So just want to get again a pulse of the audience, like you know, of the patients you see in your clinic, if you have cases of rheumatoid arthritis or SLE, lupus erythematosus, or any other complex rheumatological conditions like myositis and stuff like that. How many of these patients do you think, or children do you think, presents with pulmonary involvement? Okay, so again, it's kind of um, a hyperbolic curve, right? And uh, most people have answered, 30% of the audience have answered 27%. Correct answer is 37%. So that's why I included this case. You need to keep your eye open for looking for pulmonary involvement early on in rheumatological cases. 37% of the patients with rheumatological condition presents with have some sort of pulmonary manifestations. It's either due to the disease itself or it is due to the medications, immunosuppressive medications we use to treat rheumatological conditions. I think again, I'll have to share my, um, stop sharing and share again There's something. Can you see it? Okay. So can everybody see it, please? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is an 18-year-old girl who was evaluated for chronic cough. She was diagnosed initially with SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, based on recurrent joint symptoms. She also had renal involvement and gastric ulcers. So she has multi-system involvement. And I will refer to her as LW. So she presented to us in October 2018 for chronic productive cough with nocturnal component for over six months duration. Shortness of breath with exercise, progressively worsening symptoms. So what do you, when you hear of nocturnal cough, you hear of shortness of breath with exercise, like, you know, she was obviously diagnosed with mentholine, but it did not make any difference and her symptoms got progressively bad and bad. So chest x-ray, I will show you later, it showed left basilar atelectasis, which was not very revealing. Blood count was unremarkable except for mild anemia, which is expected in uh, lupus patients. A bronchoscopy was done, it showed BAL should diffuse mucoid secretions, but there was no eosinophilia. Extensive infectious disease evaluation of BAL sample was negative. It was screened for every single pathogen that it could screen for and everything came out negative. This is the X-ray, which looks like, you know, with some bronchovascular markings uh, was not revealing. And because it's overexposed, you see a lot of markings and it looks interstitial, but it was reported as uh, normal. This was a lung function test. So it was done in July and October, 2018, over a period of three months. And initially, if you focus on the July uh, pulmonary function test, her lung volume FEV1, was less than 80, so that is suggestive of mild obstructive lung disease, right? And her lung volumes were normal, 90% predicted. Total lung capacity was 90% predicted. Her diffusing capacity was moderately reduced, 
to 55% predicted. Now, so that was kind of like, you know, we treated her with Ventolin, with some antibiotics, like, you know, considering bronchitis. Within like, you know, three months, her lung function deteriorated further. The FEV1 is reduced further now. FVC forced vital capacity is reduced. And more interestingly, her lung capacity, her lung capacity went from 90 to 67 moderate restrictive lung disease. Her diffusing capacity still say, stays low in like, you know, high 50s, low 60s. So then we had to do like, you know, further workup, a CT scan of chest was done. And um, you can see there is like, you know, ground glass opacities on like, you know, bilateral uh, uh, lung zones. And this is like, you know, further um, images of the CT chest and it showed peripheral ground glass opacification. And you can hear, you can appreciate the interstitial thickening um, more on the left side compared to the right. And then a lung biopsy was done. So here you can see all this cluster of these purple cells everywhere. This is uh, increased concentration or gathering of inflammatory cells, including lymphocytes, macrophages. And so following lung biopsy, so two things very important to remember in rheumatological condition, as I said, pulmonary involvement, decrease in pulmonary symptoms, um, decrease in lung function test, they both, and an abnormal CT scan and abnormal biopsy could be due to two reasons. One is either infection, which could be due to immunosuppressive medications, which were used to treat the rheumatological condition, correct? Or the second reason could be her, her lupus is worsening, and the, now there is a pulmonary component of lupus. Now the treatment becomes totally different. If it is infection, then you have to cut out all the immunosuppressive medication and steroids she's getting for her lupus. But if it is due to lung disease, if it is due to her lupus flaring and getting lung involvement, you have to increase the immunosuppressive medications. So the treatment are totally opposite. So you have to be very careful. Even the lung biopsy specimen was, was scanned for all the infectious pathogens. It came negative. The lung biopsy showed increased infiltration with um, mononuclear cells, and it was then diagnosed that she has worsening of her or, or involvement of her lungs, her respiratory system in her lupus. So she was started on cytoxin infusion. So we increased her doses of immunosuppressive therapy. Chest x-ray was normal, respiratory symptoms completely resolved, and she returned to competitive sports by four weeks. PFTs are dramatically improved by three months or 12 weeks. And repeat chest X-ray was done again after 12 weeks, which was completely normal. And we will repeat CT scan at some point of time to see resolution of the abnormal CT scan I showed you earlier. And this is very interesting. So this was done in March of 2019, which is six months after, five to six months after the, the, the worsened lung function test. And you see the forced vital capacity improved to 99. FEV1 was normal. The lung volumes were normal to 83. The total lung capacity, which went down to 67, became 87. Diffusing capacity was mildly reduced to 74 and 79. So her lung function totally turned back. Her symptomatic improvement was marvelous. Um, but again, the treatment are two extreme opposites. Like, you know, so it's very important to find the reason behind the, the respiratory involvement. Um, Couple quick slides. So un, there is, we don't know the exact prevalence of lung disease in children with rheumatological condition. As I said, various studies have shown it is up to as good as 37%. Mainly like, you know, this data is gathered from case reports in children. Respiratory symptoms reported commonly in adult patients with rheumatological disease. In pediatrics, you don't see it as much, but the recent studies have shown it's more common than we think it is and lung involvement is being recognized more frequently now. Um, you can see different kind of thoracic pathology. You can see bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonias. You can see eosinophilic pneumonia. You can see um, ground glass opacities. You can see um, uh, opacification like you know, the lower pneumonia. So you can see different kind of pathology and you can also see interstitial lung disease in these kids. One minute. Sorry, one minute? Yeah, I'll be done in one minute. Mm. 
In children, more than 50% of cases of lung involvement occurred after the rheumatological diagnosis. So um, very uh, important to keep a keen eye on that. And sometimes the lung disease comes before joint involvement or at the same time. And I've seen a lot of cases of uh, dermatomyositis and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis presenting with pulmonary symptoms, and then they have joint and skin involvement. In adults, most cases are after the onset of joint involvement. So you have to be very, very uh, cautious when you encounter a patient with rheumatological condition to do respiratory screening. Some reports of lung disease onset is post-treatment. It happens after, like in this case, it happens from days to months after the initial condition have been treated. And as you can see in these slides, like, you know, the frequency of initial presentation and frequency during the disease course is common across the spectrum of rheumatological conditions, from SLE to um, sarcoidosis to systemic sclerosis to Wegener's. And again, the mechanism is lung structures are highly vascular. So macrophages, which engulf the inhaled antigenic stimuli, so whatever antigen comes to those macrophages, they lead to inappropriate activation of CD4, T, and B cells. And it causes like a hyperbolic immune response in your lungs. An underlying autoimmune process determines which part of respiratory system would be predominantly affected, whether the airways or the vasculature. And symptoms are very common, coughing, wheezing, difficulty in breathing, chest pain. So they're like symptoms varies widely and they're the most common presenting symptoms we see in bronchiolitis or we see in pneumonias or asthma. And so it has been um, recommended to do full pulmonary function test during diagnosis and before starting the treatment, two to four years from diagnosis in, in an asymptomatic child and before and after treatment in a symptomatic child. And you should do regular evaluation of pulmonary symptoms and um, look for serial PFTs. And you should also look and treat for infection in, in between if necessary. These are my references and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vizbana. Uh, tonight cases are excellent, both Dr. Fatima and you. Thank you very much. I would like to request uh, Dr. Fatima, Dr. Rizvana to join the panel. And I would like to request uh, Dr. Kalpana and Dr. Joshi to join and start the panel and Q&A session. Over to Dr. Kalpana. Thank you, doctor. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So first and foremost, let me thank both the speakers for their excellent presentations and uh, Really, the cases have taken our brains in three different directions. So uh, thank you. The slides were excellent. And there have been a lot of questions being asked. Uh, the, actually, the participation by the audience was good. However, we could not keep up and inform you, Dr. Fatima. Sorry for that. Um, so, uh, there have been a lot of questions, but I would like to start uh, by asking Dr. Fatima about uh, the incidence of cystic fibrosis in UAE. Uh, is, you know, and how some common pointers for pediatricians when they should uh, keep this diagnosis in mind. I think Dr. Fatima uh, has not joined. Uh, can Dr. Rizwana, you take this question? Yes, yes I can. I can. Um, it's a uh, very, uh, it's very, okay, Dr. Fatima is here, so I will give it. Yes, Dr. Fatma. We were just I am uh, here. wanted. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. I had the phone call. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, just uh, starting the uh, panel discussion, first and foremost, thanking you for your excellent presentation. Um, wanted to know about the incidence of uh, cystic fibrosis in UAE, in GCC. Wow. And okay. also some common pointers for pediatricians to pick up this diagnosis or to suspect. Okay, uh, exact answers uh, in UAE, I cannot uh, answer. It's very difficult to answer. But I know we have roughly in pediatric population around 50 patients. In Rashid Hospital, they have around 100 patients. Uh, similarly, in Abu Dhabi, they have around 15 pediatric, around 100 in 
adult. And the GCC, I know the highest incident is in Saudi Arabia, and they follow around 500 cases in uh, King Faisal Hospital, which is one of the largest CF uh, uh, center in, uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. They do have other CF centers as well. I'm not aware, but I know in King Faisal, they follow around 500 cases. In Oman, uh, they do have similar cases uh, to us, but uh, their mutations are different because of a high consanguinity uh, among their uh, children. Uh, Kuwait, Qatar, um, uh, Bahrain, I have no idea. I'm so sorry. How to pick up the diagnosis? Failure to thrive, um, stool abnormal, um, uh, chest manifestation with cough infection, uh, recurrent pneumonia, uh, dehydration, yani any abnormal presentation, multiple organ involvement, think about cystic fibrosis. There is no harm to repair, there is no harm to do sweat chloride, uh, there, there is no harm to do extra investigation for cystic fibrosis. Nowadays, alhamdulillah, for the last two, three years, we have neonatal screening. They refer all um, high IRT to us, so we detect them early. And lately, I have a well, few infants, uh, alhamdulillah, that we detected their IRT before even the parent knowing that they have cystic fibrosis and they are, uh, they are following in our uh, um, uh, clinic. So uh, neonatal screening, check that, check the IRT, call us, we don't get the step. WhatsApp us, email us, whatever you like. Repeat IRT if it, if it is border level. If it is still border level or high, refer to us, we will take care of it. I know sweat chloride is not available everywhere. It's only in Dubai, it's only in DHA, but we can help you with any patients. Thank you. Yeah. Question is about IRT. Do you recommend the screening for cystic fibrosis in all the babies? Are we doing it in all the babies? Because in private, you know, different hospitals are choosing different packages where IRT is not included. Yeah, yes, for the last uh, two, three years, IRT is part of neonatal screening, and it is there for uh, cystic fibrosis screening. Uh, some of the uh, private places, they are so good. They do IRT and they do the gene test, the common uh, five mutation, including Delta 508, because Delta 508 consists of seven 70% of the mutation uh, for cystic fibrosis. So private places, they even do the gene test. IRT is there, it is part of the neonatal screening. So check that always. I know some places they, they sleep on the neonatal screening. I know it takes time before they get the result and the patient get discharged because they do very well. But remember to go back and check the neonatal screening. Make sure everything, including the, including IRT cystic fibrosis, is normal. I want to add something. Sorry. So I want to add something to what Dr. Fatma said. The one thing we also need to understand that um, UAE and Dubai has a significant amount of um, expat population. So the babies are not born in UAE like if they are born in other countries. Again, that remains a question mark whether the newborn screening was done in that particular country or not. And um, another message what Dr. Fatma beautifully said is like, you know, a high level of suspicion. So if you have failure to thrive, recurrent respiratory symptoms, recurrent GI symptoms, uh, sweat test is very cheap, very non-invasive and very easy to do. Like, you know, so it should, um, it's okay to like, you know, do it as a screening test rather than missing a case of cystic fibrosis for two or three years and that causing recurrent lung damage to the child's lungs. Is there a minimum age or minimum weight required for sweat chloride test? Uh, yes, uh, at least three weeks of age to four weeks, you can do sweat chloride. But I recommend IRT in the beginning in infancy and they can do it up to three weeks of age. So after that, IRT will not be uh, reliable then you can do sweat cooler. Before that, you cannot do. Right. Very so, good question, uh, Dr. Josie. If IRT is uh, indicative, uh, the 
dictum is to repeat it once before you go further, isn't it, doctor? Yes, if it is high, very high, and usually uh, high IR, IRT babies, they have symptoms. Yani khalas, we go directly for the gene test. Uh, gene test. Uh, yeah, we jump over. But if you have borderline or slightly elevated, we recommend to repeat the IRT if the age allow you. But then if it doesn't, uh, you go further with the sweat chloride. And we always recommend to take, it's a standard, you need to take two uh, com consecutive sweat chloride to confirm the diagnosis. Of course, gene detection, you know, sweat chloride high above 100 halas, it is cystic fibrosis with the manifestation they might have. But gene therapy, it is nowadays good to know the prognosis, the severity of the disease, and even for um, uh, potential gene therapy. Right. And uh, are there any false positives or false negatives as far as sweat chloride testing is concerned? Uh, yes, there is always. I mean, with any test, you have uh, sometimes uh, 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 it's not conclusive, or sometimes you will have um, like 50 or just below 60 sweat chloride. You would say cystic fibrosis is negative, but we don't. We repeat it because we do have cases of uh, uh, atypical cystic fibrosis who might have intermittent sweat chloride uh, result, and they don't have the typical picture. And usually these patients are detected and diagnosed, diagnosed later in life where their gene test come positive, but with a very rare, rare uh, gene. They they are usually diagnosed in adolescence, for example, or even adults. Right. And uh, is the Delta F508 uh, the most frequent one that you would find here in the cohort uh, that you uh, are? Uh, yes, not thinking. among local. The, the uh, frequent gene among local is S549R. Uh, uh, this is very common about, among local. And we have actually certain families who have these gene tests and who are getting married to each other, like al uh, like al uh, like, uh, yeah, such family. They, we when we say the name, we know it's a cystic fibrosis, especially if they come with uh, symptoms. Uh, Delta F508 is more common in Asia, uh, in India, Pakistan, it's, it's very common. I haven't seen so far a local, if I'm not mistaken, with, uh, with, with Delta 508. It is not very common in this area. In Saudi, yes, they do have uh, Delta F508. Uh, um, they have different type of consanguinity. Saudi Arabia is a very huge country. Uh, they do get married, but uh, within the Middle East, but then they get married to each other. So they do have more Delta uh, F508 than us. Right. Uh, is it important to always have the genetic testing? Because like, uh, for example, in your second case, um, you know, of course, if it's available and you can do it, you went further and further and further to prove the diagnosis. But ha if we didn't have that, could we not still label it as uh, most probably to be cystic fibrosis and uh, do, you know, the treatment as such? Uh, very good question, Dr. Kalpana. Um, Yes, the gene test is uh, important to confirm the diagnosis, but then you have to take into consideration other factors, socioeconomic factor of the patient. If they don't, if they cannot afford, we know gene tests cost a lot and we send it abroad to get the result. So it costs a few thousand, yani. if their salary is just a couple of thousand, they cannot afford it. But then, Okay, gene test, if you know this is cystic fibrosis and you are treating as a cystic fibrosis and you have all the clinical sign and sweat chloride, which is, which as uh, Dr. Rizwana mentioned, very cheap and it's positive and it's confirming cystic fibrosis diagnosis. And they are responding to the treatment, but they cannot afford the gene therapy. And even if they afford it, they are not gonna start the gene uh, 
uh, gene, uh, I mean the gene test, and they are not going to start the gene therapy, then you can delay that. And you can see when it's highly indicated and take it. So take into consideration, is this uh, yani, a patient with high sweat test, the result uh, having all the cyst symptoms or cyst of cystic fibrosis? Uh, we do have many cases actually that we don't, uh, we didn't and they identified the gene uh, result because they cannot afford it simply. So you manage them accordingly. When the car, when the time comes, inshallah, later on, then you can do the gene test. I and mean, gene test will not change the management, will not add on the treatment. It, it is more to tell you about the prognosis, how severe is the cystic fibrosis, and I mean, a, a, a potential for gene therapy. How much of so the diagnosis and treatment is covered uh, with the insurance here in the UAE? Because you uh, expect patients. Once you mention cystic fibrosis for the insurance company, they will not cover it, unfortunately. So I cheat, unfortunately, to help the patient. So I write uh, recurrent pneumonia, or I write chronic pancreatitis, or chronic diarrhea, or I use such yani. Uh, we need to help them now, and of course we we. We seek many charity organizations to help them. It's never enough. Cystic fibrosis is a very, very expensive disease. And even, I'm sorry, the rich people, they cannot afford it. It's very expensive. Right. Uh, you mentioned about the prognosis, genetic diagnosis and prognosis. So is it like different mutations would have uh, different prognosis? Has that been described? Uh, it depends on the severity, Dr. Kalpana. I think I have showed a slide where you can where you can know uh, which gene mutation goes with with which defect uh, in the uh, th synthesization of the protein or transportation of the protein or even the channel itself. So those who can have mild disease, those who have alternate uh, channel, uh, which is working and not working, those will have very many, they will have symptoms. You cannot even think about cystic fibrosis in these patients. So those will have um, uh, milder manifestation because they, they do synthesize the protein they do have transportation of the protein to the uh, to the cell service, and they do have some channels open. Other are closed. So these, you will never know they have cystic fibrosis. We have others that they have the channel closed. So it depends where the defect is in the cell, the severity will be um, uh, accordingly. So those who have severe uh, manifestation, those who has no protein set, they don't produce protein or they don't even pro uh, transport the protein to the cells. Mm -hmm. They will have severe pancreatic insufficiency. They, have, uh, they will have uh, lung manifestation and yani, they will even die early because they will uh, progress in the disease uh, very rapidly. Dr. Fatima, I would like to interrupt and ask one question. Please. As you said, I mean, treatment of this, I mean, there is no cure, we are even supporting. What is the closest uh, diagnosis, which is three tables? Suppose the patient doesn't have money at all. I mean, what we should think three table condition, which we can do something. I mean, just the closest differential diagnosis, three table, where we can- To cystic fibrosis? Yeah, any closest the, uh, pediatric diagnosis to yeah, cystic three fibrosis? Three uh, uh, honestly, uh, cystic fibrosis can present um, by anything, Dr. Sarah. It could be from a simple um, uh, infection in the chest to sepsis, as you have seen. Yani, it could be anything. Differential diagnoses are too many. Why? Because you have... Uh, multiple organ involvement in cystic fibrosis. You have renal, you have intestine, you have abdomen, you have liver, you have pancreas, you have chest, you have endocrine. Yani, uh, you uh, imagine all the differential diagnoses in the pediatric book. 
can go with cystic fibrosis because it depends which organ is mostly affected. They will present uh, with the symptoms from that particular organ, maybe plus other organs same time. What is keeping in view only clinical? You, I mean, by clinical, if you are going, I mean, you diagnose and you don't treat other condition. You go directly for cystic fibrosis. I mean, if patient is poor and nothing can be done, I mean, to confirm the diagnosis. I mean, will I you think give antibiotic? Will you, I mean, try all these therapies to finally come and reach? I mean, patient, when you don't have, I mean, the, the, the diagnosis, to, I mean, Patient is poor and you can't really go for diagnosis. I mean, ah, yani if you cannot diagnose them as cystic fibrosis, you mean, sah? Yeah, you try uh, other how to treat. multi-therapy you give. Uh, how to treat, uh, yani if you don't have the diagnosis confirmed of cystic fibrosis, how to treat them? This is what you are asking me. What I mean to say, you give antibiotic, you give whatever comes yes, in the mind. Yani, what is the presentation? According to the presentation, Dr. Zara, if you have dehydration, hyponatremia, you will correct that. If you have chest infection, you will give antibiotic. If you have pancreatitis, for example, acute pancreatitis, you will give them uh, NPO and you will treat uh, with uh, anti-inflammatory, you will do accordingly. If you have uh, diarrhea, you will try to give a supplement, you will glide, try to give nutrition, you will try, yani, uh, according to the presentation, you treat. And this is what we do with cystic fibrosis. Actually, we try not to refer our cystic fibrosis patient to other, uh, yani, um, other multidisciplinary that much. We try to manage them ourselves. It's all about pediatric management. Yani, we are not doing magic. We are not doing anything extra. Yani, we are managing the presentation and the symptoms they are having, plus yani, extra um, cystic fibrosis management. Thank you. But we are treating accordingly, so no, nothing. And what you are going to do, if you don't know this is cystic fibrosis, correct what is wrong. Make it right as much as you can. But then you cannot control it. Refer to gastroenterologists. Maybe there they can diagnose cystic fibrosis. Refer to pulmonologists. Refer to endocrine. Trust me, ultimately, sometimes it takes time for the patient. And Unfortunately, but ultimately they will reach where they're supposed to reach. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, the idea is to shorten the journey of the patient, yani to make them reach as soon as possible. Uh, always have cystic fibrosis as a backup uh, differential diagnosis in your mind yani, uh, when you have something unusual or you have multi organ. Keep it in your mind. It is never, never wrong to exclude cystic fibrosis. But I would say it will be yani, very painful for the patient to delay that when you have the facility to do it. So do it one time extra, two times extra, three times extra. You have the right to confirm um, uh, until it is really negative. Thank you. We have some uh, questions about the clinical uh, presentation as well as about the treatment of uh, cystic fibrosis and uh, maybe even Dr. Rizwana can give her input. Um, mm. uh, one is uh, actually very specifically related to your case number three, uh, uh, doctor. Is rash a common presentation or is it a part and parcel of cystic fibrosis in that patient? Now, frankly, that clinical presentation was uh, not something we would directly think of cystic fibrosis. So what made you think that this is cystic fibrosis rather than the multiple other diagnoses like HLH? Uh, and there's another question regarding hemolytic anemia in that child. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Is it because of the vitamin E deficiency? So this is to you, Dr. Fatima. Uh, to me, or, okay. I thought I would give the chance. No, to because this is, yeah, this is your case, and then we'll go to Dr. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, when it comes to uh, skin rash, it is not a normal, uh, uh, typical cystic fibrosis presentation, but yes, they can 
present with, I don't have picture, unfortunately, uh, I could have shown, but they have a typical rash, which indicate on zinc deficiency. So low zinc, they will have a skin manifestation. And it is like um, a typical cystic fibrosis rash. If you see it, it's all over, it's grayish, it is flaking, any typical cystic fibrosis. If you have seen that before, you will know it immediately. And it, it, it indicates a zinc deficiency. Uh, and of course, because of dehydration, they get dry uh, because of uh, this, uh, the chloride uh, uh, disturbance, all this lead to the skin uh, manifestation. Your second question, it's not common, no, but we have seen, I might have seen so far three or four cases maximum of skin, skin manifestation, and they can present very early. And usually, uh, those with the skin manifestation, they have pseudobartar. Yeah, and both pseudobartar and the skin manifestation. We had one who came with pseudobartar skin manifesta manifestation and sepsis, DIC. Um, she was almost in shock. By then, we got to know that it was cystic fibrosis. Um, they can present very early in infancy with the skin rash also. Uh, your second part uh, of the question? Anemia, anemia and cystic fibrosis. Uh, anemia. That child uh, had six grams hemoglobin. Yeah, six grams. It is not, uh, it is because of uh, coagulopathy. Uh, if you have this coagulation, they, ha they will have bleeding. Yani it is due to, to bleeding and disturbed uh, coagulation. It is not that they have some kind of anemia. Of course, malabsorption, all that will lead to anemia, but this is mainly because liver is affected and mainly because coagulation is disturbed and there is a microbe. Yes, Dr. Joshi. Dr. Wagi, the same as few questions about the treatment and uh, the uh, prophylactic antibodies. First question is, uh, what is uh, what are the prophylactic antibiotics that you use for cystic fibrosis? Uh, what like, are the prophylactic antibiotics we use in cystic fibrosis? Yeah, yeah. We, we use So I think Dr. Rizwan has to use, so she can just. Please help me. Sorry. <laughs> so Dr. Rizwan has to leave. She has another commitment. Yeah. Can I leave? Uh, yeah, please. please. That's please. okay. Thank yes. you so much. Appreciate. There's one question for you, Dr. Rizwan. Yeah, there are a Go couple ahead. of questions yeah. for you, actually. The one question is about the uh, pulmonology involvement in uh, rheumatic uh, diseases. How do you differentiate whether it's caused by the disease itself or by vasculitis or by infection or uh, some other etiology? Right. So if you don't have a baseline evaluation before you start immunosuppressive medication ah. like steroids or uh, cytoxin or uh, methotrexate, so then it's very difficult to tell, right, whether the deterioration in your lung function happened after the treatment was started or it was going on because of the disease prior to the treatment was started. Now, usually the immunosuppressive medications will cause infections, um, common infections and opportunistic infections. Whereas the disease will present with interstitial lung disease, vasculitis and all these things. So before you make a plan for the treatment, of course, you do the lung function test to figure out how badly your lungs are impaired. Then you do a BAL, bronchoalveolar lavage, and a flexible bronchoscopy, and you send that fluid for millions of infectious organisms to make sure there is no infection, there is no opportunistic infection. And then to establish whether it is due to a disease process, vasculitis or interstitial uh, pneumonia or broncho bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia, boob you need to do a lung biopsy. That's the, that will establish the diagnosis. But so it's very important to do the lung function test prior to starting the treatment. That's the key point here. Right, and the second question is about methotrexate. Is the lung involvement related to dose duration or is it idiosyncratic reaction to methotrexate? Uh, both, dose and duration. So duration is more important because it can cause progressive lung fibrosis. So if you catch it up early on with like, you know, three months of met methotrexate, the expected fibrosis would be less than if you have given it for two years, for example. So it's very hard to tell because it's where you catch the patient, but yes, it is um, duration related for sure. 
Recently, I had one of my patients' mom actually. She was put on methotrexate, and in fact, she developed within few weeks of methotrexate, and in fact, uh, she died within three. And uh, what was the condition she was put on methotrexate for? Yeah, there was no. Uh, I think most likely it was reducing critic uh, pulmonary fibrosis. That's what yeah. they told. Initially, it was normal. But that's uh, because pulmonary fibrosis is one of the side effects of methotrexate. Okay, Kalpana, you have anything? Yeah, it's in relation to your uh, first case, Dr. Razwana. Um, uh, now that child, uh, like you mentioned, had uh, symptoms for four years and then underwent investigation uh, for every symptom that he had, you know, a battery of investigations. And then finally the diagnosis of uh, POTS was reached. So uh, how can we minimize or what would be your one pointer to say that uh, uh, this can be picked up early. Uh, we had a case like this, and uh, fortunately enough, uh, it didn't go on for many, many years like this. But yes, uh, what would be the pointer to the general pediatricians? Two things. I would uh, emphasize two things. So one is when you got like you know symptoms involving different systems, like you know when it is especially cardiac, she had palpitation, she had um, chest pain, and she also had neurological symptoms like fainting, dizziness, and all those things when those things comes in the mind, like even for vasovagal syncope, because, you know, dysautonomia is not a single term. It's not ports. It includes a um, lot of other conditions, including vasovagal syncope. So that needs to, orthostatic vitals is very easy to do, very uh, simple to do. Absolutely. At some point of time, rather than doing echo and Holter and, and EKG and like, you know, CT scan and brain MRI, simply doing orthostatic vitals could have saved a lot of time and a lot of like you know, energy for this family and for everybody involved in the care. So I should Halter not pick it just a minute, just uh, should Halter not give us some idea of the variation in heart rate as well? Uh, right. Uh, so it's 24 it, hours monitoring. So it's not like, so dysautonomia, it's like intermittent symptoms. It doesn't happen every single time. So this was picked up when she was symptomatic. So if you are not having that, so you don't have um, variation in heart rate like 24-7, 365 days. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. when that imbalance strikes in your system Absolutely. and you start having symptoms, it was easy to diagnose. Number two, what I've observed, a lot of um, uh, neurological cases like cerebral palsy, uh, brain involvement due to some anatomic brain issues. We see a lot of patients like this and they have autonomic instability. You okay. see unexplained fevers, you see unexplained um, bradycardia, tachycardia, hypotension, respiratory symptoms. So rather than doing million dollar investigation every single time, it's better to think of this as a possibility which is causing this, like, you know, um, causing the symptoms had one spike of fever for two days and then the patient got better. We don't need to kind of like, you know, run an area of investigation for those patients. Absolutely. Was the blood pressure also changing in that patient? Yes, and then when symptomatic, she had orthostatic hypotension, yeah. But nobody measured for the first four years because she presented with respiratory symptoms. Usually those patients, and once you are labeled as panic attack, psychogenic, then everything fits into that thing, whether you are fainting or whether you have palpitations. Especially that age group. Uh, one last thing I want to say about um, cystic fibrosis from my little experience is like IRT. So as Dr. Fatma said, we need to emphasize on clinical signs and symptoms. So IRT, elevated IRT is not present in 15%, 1, 5, 15% of the cases with cystic fibrosis because that's immune reactive trypsinogen, which is a pancreatic enzyme. So if you are not, if you do not have the mutation of cystic fibrosis that causes pancreatic insufficiency, if you are pancreatic sufficient, then you would not have elevated IRT on your newborn screening. So even like, you know, I mean, my mentor from my fellowship days, he used to make me do... Um, sweat test in, in kids with um, like a little uh, weird presentation of asthma. Like, you know, so sweat test is kind of like, you know, a non-invasive tool to, to perform like, you know, in such patients. Clinical diagnosis is the most important thing. And I want to answer one last thing before I leave about Dr. Saurabh's question. In from the armamentarium of treatment, if somebody asked me to choose only one treatment for kids with cystic fibrosis, that would be airway clearance, optimal aggressive airway clearance. Bronchodilators, hypertonic saline, if you can't afford palmozyme, followed by chest physiotherapy is the mainstay of treatment to keep that mucus accumulating in one particular region and causing 
regarding pneumonia. Very cheap also, very cheap also. Yeah. Not <coughs> ideal, but... but uh, yeah. I agree. Uh, two uh, more things. Uh, One, there is a comment from Dr. Sophia regarding your uh, case of POTS. Uh, she's uh, writing in from Greece and she says it's essential to have a good exercise program for the patient with POTS. Uh, that's number one. And second, how, how did you uh, decide to treat that patient with fludrocortisone? There have been multiple therapies, uh, you know, treatments that have been described. So that was why, that, why that was in particular? From that, that was a case in US, like, you know, that was in Boston. Okay. So once okay. we made the diagnosis of ports, we referred them to a sports specialist. So all the cardiac okay. exercise program, compressive stockings to increase the blood pressure, yeah. And, and fludrocortisone, salt management and hydration was um, planned by the cardiology team over there, the port specialist team over there. Okay, and uh, they decided on the medication as well. Okay. Thank you so uh, much, Dr. Rizwana. We'll I, continue with Dr. Fatma. Thank yeah, you can much. I just um, uh, comment on uh, one of the question in the question and answer uh, panel? Yes, Dr. Um, it's regarding uh, boriconazole uh, treatment yes. for PPA, yes. yeah. Why we, I mentioned boriconazole. <clears throat> uh, usually we treat ABPA with uh, steroids, but I hate steroids because I know in cystic fibrosis, uh, if, you, if you use the high dose uh, uh, prednisolone or uh, steroid for ABPA, uh, they can easily develop uh, diabetes mellitus. And they have enough problem <laughs> and I feel, I don't, wanna, I don't want them to go um, yani early in life in this direction. They will ultimately develop the diabetes mellitus, but I don't want to overload them with steroid uh, to avoid that. So I choose uh, personally to, uh, and you can do that as well, uh, to uh, treat them with antifungal. And why I have chosen Vori, not Itra, because Itra is more expensive. This is a Pakistani girl who cannot afford it. So Vori is good enough if you have a, uh, access to that and uh, with a good doses, plus um, immunotherapy. I can have access to immunotherapy uh, with zero percentage on the patient because uh, we do have charity and um, uh, some of the insurance can cover it and it is part of the treatment and it's a safer treatment with very, very good result. Of course, they will have it for long term. I mean, they, they need to take it for a long, long uh, time. But see, I mean, it, it is cheaper for the patient. It is safer. Uh, at least they will develop uh, diabetes later on. They have enough to have, I mean, the, the less complication they have, the better. Um, uh, of course, you have to put them on regular uh, antibiotic uh, prophylaxis as well. In addition to um, immunotherapy and antifungal, they have to go on um, uh, 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 prophylactic antibiotic to, to suppress the chronic infection. They have. That was a question. Which antibiotic do you use, uh, Dr. Joshi asked? Which yeah. The available one, we have a blocloxacillin, they can have it as a prophylactic antibiotic. We have Zethromax, they can have it as a prophylactic uh, antibiotic, or even trimotoprene, uh, you, sometimes we use it as a prophylactic antibiotic. I usually put them on the prophylactic antibiotic during the winter month, where infection is too much, viruses are too much, and I give them a break during the summer time. Um, uh, but then we continue, and then we we continue detecting the um, the bugs and the sputum culture. Oh, but then when it's time, we even stop it. Yeah. If they are uh, doing well, we could control uh, the bug. We can stop the problem. Nebulizer antibody. Nebulizer antibody. Do you use any? Regular. Nebulizer aerosol. Do we yes. have it here? Uh, nobilization, yes, we have uh, colomycin, we have gentamicin, we have tobramycin. These are commonly used uh, and these are available in, in UAE. In Europe and US, they have even uh, other uh, nobilized uh, antibiotic, which we lack here, uh, unfortunately. Now, I prefer, and I think it's mentioned in the European uh, cystic fibrosis management, giving 
يعني most of the time mobilized antibiotic because the concentration, the, the MIC uh, level will be much, much higher when you give nobilized rather than IV. يعني penetration of nobilized antibiotic is much, much greater than IV. So I prefer, especially if I do a trial of uh, eradication, I prefer using mobilized uh, antibiotic together with the IV or with oral antibiotic. Okay. Dr. Vajit Hussain is asking, do we need pancreatic enzyme supplements even in respiratory phenotype? Uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement and respiratory phenotype? I didn't get the answer. Pancreatic enzyme replacement is uh, when you have pancreatic insufficiency or yani, if you have uh, moderate or mild pancreatic insufficiency. It depends how much the pancreatic is insufficient. You replace the enzyme with pancreatic enzyme. Yani basically, kirion is a lipase which uh, replaces the enzyme for, from the pancreas, and it's taken with food to avoid malabsorption and to enhance the reabsorption of fat, carbohydrate, and protein. Um, yani it's not a treatment for a respiratory phenotype, uh, but yes, uh, uh, some of the mutation, you have mild uh, pancreatic insufficiency, uh, cystic fibrosis mutation. And some of them, you have severe pancreatic insufficiency. You cannot tell, but yani, you have to uh, detect that with the uh, fecal elastase and then the clinical finding. Yeah. Yani, sometimes they do have moderate pancreatic insufficiency, but they require high doses of creole. I give kirion or pancreatic enzyme until I have a normal stool, normal growth, no abdominal pain, no problem, no greasy stool, no foley smelling the stool, no frequent stool. And I try to make the stool as normal as possible, regardless the age, regardless how much is the fecal elastase, regardless how severe is the pancreatic insufficiency. Right. There's a question from Dr. Asma on how diet can improve the condition of cystic fibrosis. So the just a line on the importance of nutrition. You have uh, dealt with it in your lecture, but still. Yeah, number one, fatty food. We encourage them to eat hamburgers, KFC, uh, junk food because it contains a lot of fat. So we encourage a fat. We even ask them to add fat, extra fat in their food because they lose a lot of fat. And uh, I, I actually, <laughs> I actually go higher. Um, uh, yani, I demand more than usual usually because I need a good nutrition. Yani, I don't even want a median weight. I want above that because I know they are going to use it when they get really sick. They drop very fast. So you have to have them above median just to have a good backup when they have recurrent infection, recurrent uh, abdominal manifestation. Children, they lose very quickly. And if they are above median, okay, they will lose, but they will not lose much. They will go back to median. So nutrition is number one. Uh, it will not even uh, yani improve survival, it will improve uh, the lung infection. It won't be that much infection as if you have a child with failure to thrive. Yani, uh, better nutrition, uh, it has shown that uh, you will have a better lung prognosis, even better survival. Yani, there are many studies done on that. So concentrate on nutrition, very good nutrition, lots of protein because they do lose protein as well, lots of fruits. And uh, extra tip, I always advise them to have extra salt, extra fluid during the summer because they lose a lot during the summer. So they have to replace that very frequently. Uh, Fatima, you said this, uh, let them go and have McDonald's. Can't these be uh -huh. fatty food prepared at home so that we convey a message that we tell the parents tomorrow they will see our video, you say, see your doctor advise McDonald's, you say no. <laughs> no, no, I tell them, uh, if you like McDonald's, go have, 
uh, a meal there and don't forget to bring another meal for me. <laughs> okay, yes, I a... do. And I go against the mother. I tell them, eat hamburgers as much as you want, eat kebab, so Dr. Zohrab, as much as you like. Yani, yani, I want them to gain more weight than usual. Uh, there are a couple of questions related to gene therapy that any criteria to uh, pick and choose which child should go for gene therapy? Uh, gene therapy usually in UAE, they, uh, in Europe, US, they start from two years of age, but in, uh, in UAE, we start from six years of age. So six years, uh, you have to have the gene mutation because if you don't know the mutation, you don't know if the child is eligible for this gene therapy because gene therapy does not uh, cover all genes. There are certain genes that are covered by the gene therapy and they are, have proven that this gene muta mutation responds to, to this uh, gene therapy. It depends where the defect is. Yani. So gene test you have to have, age is there, but then uh, nothing else, nothing else. Right. But you keep them well as much as you can until they are six years. So when they take the gene therapy, you see the difference. And if you have a chronic colonized since many years, if you have failure to thrive since many years, they will not have a better chance with the gene therapy. It's, it's already any late so gene therapy does not make that much difference but if they are doing well well you see as if they are not having uh, even cystic fibrosis as a diagnosis once they start the gene therapy so what we try to do we keep them as well I mean, as much as possible well as much as possible as long as possible so, so they can have benefit of the gene benefits of the gene therapy now they are working very hard to develop new gene therapy for even other mutation. And I think they are going to go very far. But unfortunately, the only obstacle we have is the price of the gene therapy. It's very high. It costs one million dirham per year. And I'm telling you, even the rich people cannot afford this expensive disease. Okay. I mean, it's too much. Right. Yeah. Uh Dr. Maria Al-Mansouri wants to know whether there's any day of awareness for cystic fibrosis in UAE. Well, wallahi, I mean, I'm asking Dr. Rozwana's help and the other pediatric pulmonologist attending this session. Let us help the cystic fibrosis uh, society, patient, let's do awareness. And there is, yes, the worldwide, they have a day for cystic fibrosis. Uh, plus, I mean, if I'm still in the hospital until, until this time, uh, you know, how I will do? If you help me, I'm, I'm very happy to do it. Sure. Let's ask one question. Cystic fibrosis day to be initiated and it was initiated in our program, the physics program. Yes, for the... <laughs> yes, 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 true. Yeah, it can be and done. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to discuss cystic fibrosis. It's a very huge topic. I mean, each manifestation, you can talk about it in many yes, hours. Absolutely. Because it, it's too many uh, organ involvements and each organ have too many uh, problems. Yeah. But you can talk endlessly. But I think and he talking about CF uh, uh, feels good to make people know about it, to make people think about it, to make people yani, be aware and uh, refer as early as possible. Any, any, uh, the, uh, uh, the more we can um, uh, slow down the process, the better chance they have. So those who are late diagnosed, yani, uh, haram, they lost a lot of their life. So this is the key point I want to share with all of you. Yes, Dr. Joshi. Yeah, Dr. Nilesh wants to know whether you have any premarital counseling for cystic fibrosis, any testing you do? Uh, no, it is, uh, we don't have that, but uh, 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 
not routinely, يعني not like thalassemia, not like sickle cell. We don't have routinely. But if there is a case in the family, yes, we do that. We refer them to geneticists and uh, we refer them to obstetric and gynae people as well. Uh, if they have planned for second pregnancy and they have a child with cystic fibrosis, yes, we help them to go to the right people and get the right consultation and further investigation as well. We have few people from Oman also who are attending. There is one Dr. Shivalangam from, uh, I think he's from Soha, and he has some comments about the uh, uncommon manifestations of like recurrent pancreatitis. Yes. And nasal polyps. Yes. And he also says that they are using CF channel potentiators like uh, Iva factor. Iva factor, yes. Yes. They are using it in I uh, yes, we do have Iva Kaftor, as I mentioned, in Abu Dhabi, and it's used as a potentiator. So those who have a problem opening the chloride channel, they use the Iva Kaftor. Yani, there is no problem with producing the protein, transporting the protein, but they have problem with opening the chloride channel. The potentiator helps them uh, yani, to improve and open some of the channel uh, on the cell surface. Um, How effective and which mutations? Uh, mutation, um, there are certain mutation in, uh, in Europe, which is which we don't have here. But here, uh, it is mainly for S549R, uh, 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 and it is very effective for them, either capital. I think uh, S549R is common in Oman as well. There are some uh, consanguineous uh, families who who have the this gene mutation as in UAE as well. So I think uh, we have uh, covered most of uh, CF as much as we could in this time span. Uh, now we come lastly to the prognosis uh, of, uh, you've already mentioned that you've met somebody who's 70 years old living a very productive life that's very good to know but on an average still the average lifespan and prognosis of these uh, patients if you can comment on that uh, so our average lifespan worldwide is 44 now yeah and some of them they live longer a few of them they pass away earlier uh, especially those who are late diagnosed or if they didn't receive the proper management, they didn't have the regular follow-up, um, yani they, they received lung transplant, transplant in their adolescence life even. And this is very early to get uh, lung transplant. But uh, even post-lung transplant, life expectancy at the moment is not very long, isn't not it? Not very, yes. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, so it depends how much care they receive. It has to do with the sea of care early in life. Uh, you see it. You see the survival. It helps a lot. Yeah. Actually, to get them on the routine, as Dr. Rizwana mentioned, yeah, if I would choose any medication and cystic fibrosis, I would choose airway clearance therapy. Uh, yeah, uh, they have to get into the routine of using regular medication. Dr. Kalpana has too many medication, and it's all the time. Imagine man, getting that into a daily life routine. It's not easy, not easy. especially when when you have uh, any children growing. Small children may be easier to control, but growing children, adolescent, forget about it. They are very stubborn. They don't want, they are sick of that. They are tired of that. They want to live their life. They don't want to do. And it's a really difficult you know, to get them in the routine and to keep it up, it's not easy. And parents, they have difficult to manage that. You know? um, so, Yani, try, we try, we try. Yani, basically get them into the routine, make it that lifestyle. And it's a big change, but it's a lifestyle. They have to continue life off. And um, just a comment on importance of having a cystic fibrosis clinic rather than, you know, each pulmonologist trying to have his or her. So yes, uh, I have. Yeah, I have spoken on previous occasion 
uh, that we need to have a cystic fibrosis center. Center. Uh, uh, yeah, with local guidelines. So. Yes, with local guidelines. We need to develop a CF registry like other countries. We have the capability, but we need to have to put hands together and work together. This is not a, a big country. This is not a huge country. And we don't have actually so much cases. So why not to unify the resources, yes. um, save the time, uh, give better for the patient. And if you have a cystic fibrosis, uh, we talked about that, but then you have uh, any politics, you have different facilities, you have different coverage, you have, yeah, it's difficult, it's not easy. It has to come from higher up. Uh, we had discussion with uh, Professor Dawan, who is in King's College, London. Actually, since 1979, I remember any case of liver support biliary atresia from anywhere in the UK, it goes to that center. Nobody can touch. I mean, if they say a system like this, as Dr. Karpela said, is implemented, that whoever suspects the cystic fibrosis should go to that place. Yes. No other but places. I mean, referrals outcomes, are there. Definitely, that. outcomes will be much better. Outcome yes. will be much better. Aslan, there are studies done all over the world, Australia, UK. Uh, outcome is yeah, greatly better when you have a cystic fibrosis center care, uh, rather than having clinics or having individual input. And it's just, it's, uh, but then if you want to initiate a cystic fibrosis um, uh, center, you have to have a minimum uh, certain um, uh, people with CF. Yeah, minimum, you have to have at least 50 patients in order to develop a cystic fibrosis. You have to have uh, resources, you have to have support, you have to have access to multidisciplinary, you have to have all the uh, category and disciplinary uh, that is required for CF care. Yeah? It's not easy, but better to unify the resources and have them in one place. This is my suggestion. But inshallah, one day we can reach it there, inshallah. Exactly. So two things we are so. doing from this program, one cystic fibrosis center was there, another... Uh, I mean, Awareness day. <laughs> Awareness day, inshallah, two yes. things. Two things. Inshallah, <laughs> inshallah God <laughs> take a long life and I will... Uh, Inshallah, for his dream, inshallah. Finally, as the life expectancy is increasing, uh, what about the reproductive aspects of uh, patients with cystic fibrosis? What about the reproductive, reproductive. reproductive aspects? Uh, infertility and reproductive uh, system? Yes, we refer them to infertility uh, center. Uh, I, I know see a patient who had naturally got pregnant and had children. Yes, I have seen that. Uh, the other option is IVF. IVF, a lot of them uh, uh, get help uh, through that. Uh, in well, case of, sorry, in case of males, aren't they, some of them have congenital absence now of vast difference? Yeah, if they have absence, they are picked up. not do much about it, but if they have, yani, um, uh, a slow movement of the sperm, then they have a better chance. It depends where the defect is and how severe is the defect. But they can have children, and actually through IVF, they can have normal children. I remember in my old practice, uh, I was attending with my professor who was like getting mad when they know that a cystic fibrosis lady get pregnant because uh, they easily get into severe complication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a cystic fibrosis pregnancy, it's another world. I mean, they can have too many complications, severe complication. So I remember my professor was getting very scared and you know, uh, furious when one of the ladies get pregnant. And they, it's as if it is end of the world, yeah, <laughs> because they do get into complication. Yeah. I remember uh, in my old practice, we, we lost one lady who was pregnant um, because of CF complication. 
but they had to take her to the emergency cesarean to save the child, but the mother was already lost. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's too much tragedy what's here, yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, I still remember it. I left it, I still remember it. No, 11.30, rest of the questions, we can uh, collect and put it in WhatsApp, uh, Dr. Kalo. Send I think she, uh, Dr. Fatma has answered almost everything. Almost yeah. everything. So before ending, I want to give one comment. There is pancreatic replacement, you said. Actually, this was introduced by Dr. Anderson, who described cystic fibrosis in 1938. One of the things she did was this also. Another thing, just for, I mean, uh, change of the topic, you said McDonald's because uh, children were coming, one child was very fat. I said, don't give so much fat food every day, person. Once I went to the queue, that patient was in front of me, suddenly turned and said, doctor, you are telling us don't come, you are standing in the queue. So that, that was one of the incidents. So Dr. Karma, thank, uh, Dr. Fatwa, thank doctor, you. Doctor, before you stop, uh, Dr. Shivalingam is asking whether all GCC countries can have one common CF awareness day. So one more suggestion for you. Inshallah. I'll do my <laughs> Inshallah. Initiated in UAE by Dubai Pediatric Club. <laughs> yeah, very good idea, Dr. Farah. Thank yes, you very much, Dr. Batman. Really, I mean, it is so interesting. At, uh, I mean, informative talk. We want to sit and because these are not discussed usually. I mean, we are conducting meetings since ages. But these yeah. are the thing. I mean, everything about this. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Rizwan also, thank you very much. If she's here, uh, uh, Tofir, thank you very much. Dr. Kalpana, Dr. Joshi, really, it was very informative session. Uh, I, I hope after uh, making the cystic fibrosis day and clinic, we'll have a panel a discussion yeah. of experts, inshallah. So there's that, lots more left to discuss. We can do that with Dr. Kalpana, Joshi, please. 4th of July, I have cystic fibrosis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so let's plan for one physical program only without cystic fibrosis. What do you think? Inshallah, whatever you say. It's sponsored by Tofir and uh, Fadi. Thank you for Tofir and Fadi. For <laughs> Question for Dr. Sora Where is the dinner now? <laughs> Don't go to McDonald's at home. Where yeah. Is the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Wallahi, Thank I enjoyed this from my bottom, from the bottom of my heart. I'm, I'm very, very, very happy to be part of this family. I enjoy every moment I spend with you. Thank you so much for Thank giving. Thank you so me. much. Thank you. We are grateful to you. You are so busy. You are still at the no, hospital, I'm, and you are still, so, you know, so taking time out. So. I'm so grateful to be part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank okay. you. I would yeah. like to thank all of you who are staying till this time. Really, thank you very much. And with this, what is your gift, Dr. Sohrab? You said there is a, a rapid draw, there is a gift at the end. Yeah. Nobody, I think, has answered. Nobody answered the question. Nobody has answered. I know that is why I don't no. know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next time, a gift from me, Isha. <laughs> yeah. And next time, we should not have such a long gap uh, for your presentation, Dr. Fatma. This time, you we had a very long gap. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll do it soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. Dr. Fatima, Dr. Kalpana, Dr. Joshi, Tofiq, Fadi, Dr. Rizwana, and all viewers. Good night. Twenty-sixth of this month, Monday, we will have a surgery uh, webinar. Inshallah, we'll meet on that day. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.